Hello, my name is Cheryl, and welcome to the Handful of Leaves podcast. Today, we will be talking about crisis, mental distress, and suicidal tendencies. This is a very heavy topic, and definitely it's not the easiest to listen to, yet it is the conversation that we all need to hear more of. Globally, nearly 800,000 people die by suicide in the world each year. That is about one death every 40 seconds. Bringing it closer to Singapore, just last year, suicide is the leading cause of death for those between 10 to 29 years old. The numbers are staggering and you never know who may be suicidal. It could be the person in the room with the biggest smile or your strongest parent or perhaps even yourself. We hope that by talking about suicide, by talking about mental distress, this episode will bring you hope if you're feeling suicidal. And if you know someone who is suicidal, this could perhaps help to shed light on what they're going through and how you can be of support to them. As a trigger warning, today's content will consist of suicide and self-harm as well as depression. If at any point you need to tune out, please pause the podcast. We will begin with a grounding exercise to center our hearts and mind as we delve into a dark topic today. Wherever you are listening to this podcast, I invite you to take a deep breath with me. Breathing in deep into your belly and breathing out, you relax. Breathing in deep, Feel a sense of calm, breathing out, you relax. Breathing in joy and breathing out, you feel at ease, grounded and centered. Today's speaker will be anonymous and we will be altering their voice so as to mask their identity. Here's a quick introduction about them. The guest has been working in the mental health space for close to five years, helping people with crisis, mental distress and suicidal tendencies to find clarity and meaning in their lives. This episode is not meant to be professional advice. If you're feeling any distress, if you're feeling any depressive episodes, please seek out professional help. We will attach some resources at the end of the podcast as well. Hello Kai Sing. hello guests. In conjunction with World Mental Health Month, we'll be talking about helping ourselves and others through mental distress and suicidal tendencies. While well, just reading through the statistics, I realised having suicidal tendencies or thoughts are so much more common than we think. And I'm really curious to hear your personal experiences. Have any of you had suicidal thoughts before? Um, at one point in time, I did have uh, some suicidal views and it was due to me recollecting about meaning in life um, and it led me to philosophical arguments internally, externally with people around. And the conclusion was that there is no meaning. Naturally, suicidal tendencies arose uh, in me. So, in short, yes, I had those views back then. I have not, but I know of friends who have confided in me who have. I find it very interesting when people say they never had suicidal thoughts. I have had suicidal thoughts before. I think it it has been from very serious to just fleeting thoughts like I'm eating a burger and like, oh, maybe death is good. (laughs) To the more serious ones where I think it's in conjunction with depressive feelings where I just stand by the side of the road and waiting for a bus and and I just wish that I would just lurch forward and a car would hit me and I just really wish I would die right then. So yes, I have had suicidal thoughts and it ranges in severity, uh, ranges in intensity depending on my moods as well. And when I talk to many friends, it seems that it is something that everyone kind of thinks about it on and off. And so I thought it was interesting that Kai Sing said she never had. Well, but Cheryl, it must be quite um, unsettling to have that thought or perhaps even uh, surprising to have that idea of wanting to jump uh, straight into the traffic. Mm. Must be going through quite a rough time back then. 
for those thoughts to have arise. Yeah, and I think I cannot like really pinpoint any particular reason. It's just a cloud of like sadness and a cloud of pain. And I do remember one time when I was driving as well, I was just feeling like, okay, I just want to just press the pedal and just go as fast as possible and just not don't know whatever or just give out all control and driving and just let whatever outcome happen so it's that that sort of feeling that that i've experienced before um but the interesting thing is that i cannot particularly pinpoint it to one specific pain it's just a whole cloud sitting on my head mm, i'm curious when was the first time you had such a thought and where do you think you got those from because for uh, for our guest, it is from philosophical kind of debate and understanding. And for you? I think it's interesting because the first time I had a suicidal thought, I, I cannot remember, but I remember the first time I felt like giving up. Uh, and that was when I was in secondary school and I was bullied and I just kind of was isolated from everyone and I just wished to, to give up. But it didn't really come across as a suicidal thought. But somehow, I think that, that similar theme and concept of just wanting to give up and escape um, somehow manifested into, into a proper suicidal thought of like really wanting to die. And perhaps it could be the influence of like learning a little bit more about, oh, people can suicide through XXX means um, and knowing of news of like, oh, people who have actually successfully killed themselves yeah and then I think it just kind of formed into an idea of this is a way to escape mm, so it's wanting to get away from the pain I do see a common thread in the conversations I have with my friends as well that seem to be one of the options that they are talking about and I know uh, our guest here you have been helping people to overcome some of these very difficult emotions I'm personally quite curious as to your journey how you got involved and also some of the, the challenges faced, perhaps also some advice so that we can all you know, walk away from this discussion with some tools to help ourselves to deal with difficult emotions as well as to be the right support for our friends who are dealing with such emotions. Yeah. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge what you said earlier in response to what Cheryl mentioned. You mentioned that Cheryl felt suicidal more in the sense of not wanting the pain to continue. And in fact, that's the uh, the sense of uh, what I get to when I, I meet or I talk to some of those that are suicidal. It is not exactly that they want to die. It's that they want the pain to end and that they feel stuck and there are no other alternatives apart from suicide. So that seems to be a common um, mental framework for some who may feel suicidal. And on to your question regarding um, the reason why I joined this organization to do uh, what I'm doing right now, which is uh, working with those who are in mental distress, helping them through their suicidal thoughts. At one point in time, um, my friend, good friend, went through a very rough uh, breakup and he was feeling uh, very suicidal, literally. Every other day, he would call me and he would tell me that um, his heart feels so much pain that he would rather die. Mm. And at one point in time, there was one night about 1 a.m. that I, I had one of those calls and suddenly he hung up his phone. So in a state of panic, I took a cab to his place. And in that cab ride, I called in the suicide hotline here in Singapore. And what did they respond um, it was actually an automated response that said that I'm on hold for about 15 minutes, maybe 10 minutes. I don't remember, but it was quite a while. And that's when the thought arose in me that, oh dear, there are other people who are in crisis and there's not enough supply of help, of resources. So that's when I set the intention to want to help uh, people in the, in this uh, space and mental health, be it suicide or mental distress in whatever shape or form. And many years later, I've had the chance to join the field. And so I did. And you have been working in the field for about five years. I'm sure you have experienced many people's stories and many precious 
experiences with the people that you interact with. Can you share with me, you know, what is the most memorable one from your experience? So one of the most memorable ones that I had was uh, of this young man, boy, I would say, teenager, 16-year-old, and he has been contemplating suicide for a long time. So at one of the sessions when we spoke, he sounded very certain. He was adamant that this is it. I'm going to go. So um, we spoke further to the extent where I, um, we talked as if it was his last conversation since he was so, so clear. And that was when he opened up to all of his past, his life stories in that final conversation or the simulated final conversation. Um, he expressed that he ultimately missed his dad who has passed away. That his dad was the only person who could understand him and now he's the only guy in the family, so he's taking on the brunt of bringing home the bacon, even though he's still 16 years old. The mom doesn't really care for him. This is utter neglect and loneliness. And when he felt that, and juxtaposing that with his thoughts of suicide, he realized that to truly honor his dad who has passed, he should live on and live the values that his dad has taught him. And that was something that I thought left an imprint in me that I couldn't really forget. Yeah, the only way to live, he said, is to carry on um, his dad's values. Wow, that's really powerful. And it almost gives a new purpose in life, right? Because I can't say for sure, but from my understanding especially friends who have depressive and suicidal thoughts. What I sense sometimes is that they feel like a burden to the world and maybe it's better for them not to exist. So besides escaping from their own pain, it's actually out of very good intention, uh, almost at the expense of their own welfare, uh, that maybe it's okay for me to, to leave this world and other people's life would go on. And I think what you just shared is so powerful because it gives a new purpose and reason to live and then to also be helpful and valuable to society. So from the mindset of I'm such a burden to how can I add value to other people's life, I think it's a strong push forward. Um, I, I'm actually very curious to hear how do you conversate with, with these people? Because um, number one, you mentioned about the long waiting time, right? I've watched documentaries as well, especially during COVID period. The waiting time is so long. I actually did search up online how I can be part of a volunteer uh, on the receiving end of the helpline, but in the end I didn't because I think the barrier to entry is just so high. You have to go through many months of training in order to be able to then handle phone calls. But I feel if I can walk away today with some tips just to be a better friend or even like a better listener, um, I don't know, I'm, I might say lives. And I, I hope listeners as well would be able to watch out for some vital signs within themselves or within others to kind of, uh, you know, put a stop to, to any of this very, I would say, undesirable consequences. So going back to the question, how do you usually navigate conversations when people have suicidal thoughts? That's a good question because um, more often than not, we wouldn't know that they even have suicidal thoughts. So um, the irony is that the question that we are so afraid to ask is one that we might need to ask. The question is, are you feeling suicidal? And beyond that, or in the midst of the conversation, of course, we um, know that we don't have the full picture from the, the party concerned. And Therefore, we don't have that position to give advice. Where we come in is merely to listen, to understand, to empathize. And that's how we hold the space for them to be able to articulate their own thoughts. And in doing so, it helps them by seeing their own thoughts with greater clarity. And thereafter, with, with continuous understanding, empathy, holding that space, we also ask questions for them to further clarify that. And more often than not, they find the conversation helpful 
to see more of themselves. Maybe some parts hidden, some parts clear, combining both to find a new meaning, new direction. Mm, that's very interesting. So it, it's not really trying to fix any issue, but just being there for them, offering them the space for clarity. And, and perhaps through, through that reflection, they can emerge with a better option in order to relieve their, their stress, relieve their suffering. Yeah, that's powerful. I think sometimes just simple things like presence make such a big difference. I, I'm wondering for you, Cheryl, when you have those suicidal thoughts, are there instances where you wish somebody could have done something? Wow, that's a tricky question. I think it's very hard because for me and I think many others that I hear as well, when they experience suicidal tendencies, I think because of the shame that people have associated with these kind of thoughts, um, the tendency is to isolate yourself. So, mm. you know, you close yourself in a dark room, you close yourself under a blanket or whatever it is. Um, and it's, it's to just, just hide with it. And, and when you do that, the tendencies just become louder. The tendencies just become, occupy the entire space. And... The last thing I want would actually is to reach out to people. So I do admire the courage or perhaps it's not even courage, perhaps it's desperation, right? Uh, for, for some people to, to seek for help because they may be very fearful of actually doing the deed. But usually I would just simmer in there and what helps is actually the reflection of Dharma in the sense that even if I were to end the, the body, the form, uh, the mental states are negative, the, the kind of attachments, the delusions are still there and abundant in my mind. I will have to restart the game in a new body, um, this time with a lot more bad karma and a lot more obstacles to what is already a very challenging path. So fortunately or unfortunately, because sometimes I really just want it to end, <laughs> the Dharma kind of forces me to keep afloat and keep going. But I would say it is, it is a lonely and very alone kind of process because it is something that is not social, it's not something that you openly share with others. Mm, and I think there's so much need to destigmatize this word suicide and also destigmatize just negative emotions. It's such a human thing to feel pain. In fact, it's the first noble truth, right? Understanding suffering. And um, yeah, I admire your courage for even sharing your own personal journey and do know that you have friends like us who are here for you. I, I'm also just wondering, how would it be if friends were to reach out to you when you're isolating? I would secretly feel very happy, but I would feel surprised, mm -hmm. most of all, surprised that people would suspect. It's something like you, right, Kai Sing, that you, sometimes when, when you're in a not good mood, because you've always been the person that support others, so people usually wouldn't think of you as needing help. So it's that similar kind of surprise that, oh, you actually would think that I need some help <laughs> or you would actually associate me with something so, what's that word, so unpredictable, right? Yeah, mm. So, so that, that is what I would feel surprised. And then, unfortunately, it would be skepticism. It would be, how long would this person be here for? How long would this person care? In five minutes, in a week, the person would get bored and busy. So, mm. I don't know if it's, it's a stigma or it's something that, Perhaps our guests could, could share more. Do you, do you know these trends like that where people always feel very alone, very skeptical and, and doubtful of everyone else and putting up a sort of high barrier to anyone who even tries to reach out? So that is um, definitely uh, relevant, a question, because the more we feel suicidal, the more we may, like Kai Sinelio mentioned, about feeling like a burden to society and therefore wanting to isolate ourselves. The CDC, which is the uh, US um, organization that classifies suicide under disease, quote unquote, actually uh, indicated that the cause, one of the causes of suicide are the factors that promotes uh, suicide is the stigma itself. When having the stigma, we choose not to speak about it and therefore we don't engage in help-seeking behavior. We don't even talk about it. Everything is just bottled up. And there comes in your thoughts that cycle through themselves with no additional inputs. 
that's uh, one element of isolation. The other you mentioned thereafter, when someone approaches you, you feel a little bit of uh, skepticism. You know, and how long will they even uh, be here for me? So this is something that I'm not really sure how to answer because the level of skepticism may differ from person to person. But what's uh, generally the trend is that those people who have suicidal tendencies, if they have those tendencies due to a, a dull uh, view of the world, the level of skepticism tends to be relatively high. So I would say it may compound that effect. And the feeling of being let down when someone was initially there offering help and thereafter pulls away or the person's engaged in other things, the feeling of loneliness comes back, which is um, why it's quite a difficult uh, problem to tackle, because even good intentions may lead us to hell, <laughs> as that phrase goes. It does sound really tricky, and I, I think there are two ways to look at this, right? One is, of course, we have a support system, but some support system, they might not have the capacity to support us 100%. Then the other aspect, it's about supporting ourselves. So if I have suicidal thoughts, what are some ways that I can deal with these thoughts? And I'm wondering whether you have any, uh, I wouldn't say advice, but just like thoughts on, on this. Uh, I think before that, it, mm -hmm. I thought it may be interesting also for our guests to share what are, what are some of the reasons that people could go down the path of suicidal uh, tendencies or even suicide and and then of course back to Kai Singh's question on how can we then you know help ourselves mm. in this way. Mm. So there are many reasons why people go into um, suicide ideation. Maybe we simplistically would classify it into two factors. One is when there is um, a crisis happening. Maybe you get fired from your job come home to find your spouse leaving you, your parents have cancer, all things piling up, your plate is full and you feel stress. The level of certainty in your being is uh, um, destroyed. Right? And in times of crisis like that, when emotions run high, suicidal thoughts may come. And if the stress is too unbearable, one may take the action. That's one element. The other side of things is where it's more of a continuous thought building up. It could be due to many reasons uh, that we may not have the time to cover here. It could be due to like your philosophical views, your uh, dim view of the world. It could be due to constant loneliness. It could be due to childhood trauma, mental illness especially. So there's broadly two categories. Due to intense situations all coming in together or more of a prolonged, almost chronic, aspect of suicidal ideation. And on Kai Singh's question, if we found ourselves to have those thoughts, how do we, in a sense, manage ourselves out of them or manage through them? Yeah. The fact that we can catch those thoughts initially would, I think, be a trigger for us to find solution and not to mull over them. I think this conversation helps in that our listeners would be able to then uh, like an additional antenna to, to realize that, hey, oh no, now I have a suicidal thought. That is interesting. Bring, bring forth curiosity where the thought comes from. And thereafter, investigate the causes for those um, thoughts. Is it due to certain life events, certain stress that we can't manage? Or has it been there for a long time? That's the first thing. Catching it is one. Secondly, of course, Seeking professional help is always the ideal thing to do. You could go to a counsellor to talk things through, and thereafter, you may get a um, prescription, or rather, sorry, you may be referred to a psychologist for prescriptions if needed. So the diagnosis would then help you to uh, take a step further down. On the other hand, um, talking about preventive aspects, before even having those thoughts, um, our normal practice as Buddhists to reflect on the five uh, unavoidable events, right? the five remembrances on aging, illness, death, on our karma. It helps us to view the world in a perspective where we expect 
crisis to happen, we expect those events to happen to us. And when the suicide ideation arises, we can look at it objectively to know that this could be due to other conditions that we have no control of, but we expected them to come. So maybe in brief, those are the things that we could um, keep uh, a note of. Yeah. Could you share on the five remembrances? I think you mentioned four points. So the five remembrances are that we are subject to aging, illness and death, and we have not gone beyond them. The fourth one is that we will go different and separate from the things that are dear and the things that we love. And the last one is that we are the owner of our actions and whatever we do, we will inherit the consequences. Thank you so much for sharing and also for really inviting us to investigate with curiosity our thoughts. I have a question here because from my own personal experience, I feel like when I do have these thoughts or even any sort of emotion, it feels very overwhelming. And the last thing that I want to do is to go into them to investigate because it's already so overwhelming to just experience them. So any advice on perhaps how, how to regulate myself or yeah. Definitely, um, that can be a challenge when emotions run high. So perhaps um, the, the tendency to want to use the five remembrances or to reflect on the Dharma is for those that are more cerebral. But when we know ourselves, our own nuances or tendencies, if we know that the emotions run high, acknowledge the emotion, let them arise, feel through it. It is part of the journey of our self-discovery. Though we also have to keep in mind that or I like this Zen saying to use pain as the mirror, meaning when there is pain, there is suffering. So when we see the intense emotions, we acknowledge that it is there, while at the same time we realize that when emotions run high, it's not fair to us to make any decisions or take any actions at that point in time. So simply sitting with it for, for it to subside might help. And of course, if that is still a bit challenging for some, talking to someone about it, might also uh, allow you to step outside of your emotions or to feel emotions with someone else. And therefore, you can feel a bit safe um, discussing or talking about what you're feeling. And to have that second point of view while sounding, sounding blah. From my experience speaking to friends, what they have found helpful is also to recollect the goodness. So I, I think... When your mind is very dark and dull, all you could think about is all the negative stuff. So having a list, like a go-to list of what are some virtues you have or photographs of things that can jot some happy memories, just to brighten the mind a little bit. I think that is also something that is really powerful. And I, I want to just add on to the point that our guests have earlier about the five remembrance because for people listening to it for the first time, it can sound really depressing. Like, you know, I'm, I'm still subjected to death. Then why don't I just end my life right now? But from a Buddhism perspective, because we don't believe in nihilism, means this is not your only life. If you end this life, you would then need to continue. It's like a, a series, right? We watch drama and then there's a new season, new episode, and you never know whether you would take a form of a human, an animal, or even a beings in a hell realm or heavenly realm. It all depends on the causes and conditions, which is the, the karma. You know, we are owners of our karma. And I, I think that becomes really sobering because it is about going beyond death. It is about not just understanding pain, but seeing how exactly can we go beyond pain? And that's exactly the roadmap that the Buddha has given to us. And uh, if we really want to be free from suffering, then we have to understand the second noble truth, which is there is a cause of suffering, the clinging, the attachment. And then the third one is there is a way out. And then the fourth one is the way out, which is the noble eightfold path. And that's the only sustainable way in order to yeah, to be free from any kind of distress. So personally, I find that to be really sobering. And I also know of friends who, like you, Cheryl, when you just think of, like, okay, if I were to end this life, I don't know when my next starting point would be. And 
there's a lot of negative, you know, karma and energy as well. That it, itself, it's already a very uh, powerful thought to stop them on their feet. So I, I think I just wanted to make that clarification for people who do not know the five frequent recollections of truth. Yes. <laughs> Thanks for clarifying that, Kaisin. Um, definitely the, the view of Buddhism may seem nihilistic or depressive when we look at the first noble truth. There is suffering or, or life is suffering. But when we go further, truth number three is there is a cure to suffering. So it is not the be-all, end-all. There is a way out. And that is when the nihilistic view ceases um, and we go on into a more hopeful view in Buddhism. So that's, that's, a, really that's a helpful right. clarification. Okay. I want to share a quote that I... I heard or I, I read uh, which says that whenever there is suffering, there is the opportunity to be free from suffering. I think it's, it's really how we make use of our circumstances. I, I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but the real truth, it's really about perception of our own circumstances and how we make of it. Of course, then the next step is uh, how can we expand our capacity to then perceive you know, things in a, a beneficial and skillful way. Well, like what you mentioned there, Kaisin, about how we perceive things, and it reminds us of the Salata Sutta, the Sutta which talks about the two arrows, where um, it states that everyone, regardless of whether you're a practitioner or a non-practitioner, you will feel pain, and that is the first arrow that comes. But the non-practitioner or those that are uninstructed according to the sutta, will lament, will mull it over, will beat themselves over it. And that creates a second arrow that punches through the person. Whereas a well-instructed disciple would not do that. They would see the drawbacks, the arising, the passing away of those emotions and prevent the second arrow from hitting them. I think there's a quote that says, pain is inevitable, but suffering is optional. Something yeah. like that. <laughs> it's a Facebook quote or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, think, I think that's a very beautiful thing to realize at any present moment where you're suffering, are you holding on to two arrows and are you like squeezing it a little bit harder to yourself? <laughs> or are you actually putting in the effort to try to pull the second one and then the first one? So mm-hmm. in a way, not easy, not easy at all, but it's helpful to know that in all of these things, we do have the capacity to realize that we have the option, as difficult as it may be, to still free ourselves from anything that is unnecessary and mm. additional. And I'm also wondering, in the process of trying to pull out the arrow, it's probably going to hurt even more, isn't it? So then, okay, number one, is, is that true, like from experiences? And then number two, how can we develop that tolerance and patience to really just endure the intensity of emotion as we are going through the healing journey? Because sometimes I, I believe when we are hitting the tipping point, but if we just wait a little longer, we it's either we break through or we break down. Then, yeah, how can we be able to see that? That's a very tough question, man. I don't have an answer. <laughs> Time for reflection. Because <laughs> yeah. I, even though I have not encountered suicidal thoughts, but I, I wouldn't say for sure that in the future I might not have. I think it really depends on how I got my mind now, and even when dealing with very difficult and intense emotion, I have the tendency to want to push it away. And the more intense it gets, the more averse I feel. So it, I suppose the question is also for myself, right? Because I, I don't have an answer. Like, how can I just sit with the pain even though it's freaking painful? <laughs> it, it's tough, yeah. So, like what we spoke about earlier, um, when emotions run high, logic is slow. So it's always important to preempt ourselves that we should never make any intention, decision, action when emotions are running high. And this is more of a general point also, especially when we're with our partners or at work when we argue emotions run high. Keep that in mind to not react. Right? So that's, um, of course, easier said than done. But mm-hmm. as practitioners, the element of mindfulness is something that we continue to cultivate, easy or not. And 
that is the true test of being a practitioner, I'd say. Yeah. Emotions getting the better of us. And I guess this is where the precepts or even the practice of restraining yourself comes into play. Because when your defilements are high, when your emotions run high, as you mentioned, it is where we, it, we are so tempted to just nail the shit out of the person, right? That we really despise. Be that someone else or be that ourselves. So it's mm-hmm. the element of really restraining. And I guess this is where the self-compassion piece comes into play. To know that this suffering that you feel, it's hard like a rock. How can you allow... How can you allow the gentleness, the softness of, of compassion, just like waves, you know, slowly just ease out the tension, ease out the cracks and slowly allow yourself to, I guess, dissolve and melt the pain. Uh, oh, yeah. Slowly just like, you know, eroding away. Yeah. And I really don't see any other way that could go through without compassion because it's really, you can't use fire to fight with fire, you can't use iron to fight with iron, <laughs> you will just create a bigger mess. Um, but that is the tendency, right? You want to hurt your pain, you want to hurt your uh, you want to hurt your hurt because you know no other way but actually the only way is through compassion and from there, when when your pain dissolves and you realise that all, all that is there is just that desire to want to be loved. Ah. I really like that. It's Making self-compassion second nature to you on a daily basis. One more on what Cheryl mentioned um, initially, mindfulness, and then restraint, and then self-compassion. In the Siddhartha Sutta, where it was a story of the two bamboo acrobats, one at the bottom, one at the top, the disciple or the younger acrobat at the top um, actually told his master that um, at, who was at the bottom, she or he, I'm not sure the gender, but they said that um, if I take care of my balance and you take care of your balance, then we will successfully perform and then we get our reward. Whereas initially the master uh, insisted that you take, care of your, you take care of my balance and I take care of your balance. So there is an element there of self, focusing on self first. And in that sutta, the Buddha mentioned that indeed, um, the younger one was saying the right thing to focus on the self. And thereafter, he expounded that by focusing on the self, it is done through mindfulness, the meditations, and that is how you take care of yourself. And in taking care of yourself, you take care of others. So we can see here that mindfulness is important to take care of yourself. And when we take care of ourselves, we take care of others. And how do we take care of others? Again, the Buddha commented that it is through compassion and goodwill. And in taking care of others, we take care of ourselves. So it encapsulates what we talked about, about mindfulness, which leads to restraint, which also cultivates compassion. And I'm just curious to know, you know, when you do this sort of work where you deal with a lot of people who almost like presenting their gifts of pain to you, how do you take care of yourself? Then? All right. So um, I, yeah, that, that question recalled me of what Ajahn Chah said. Um, so he does something similar in, in his uh, life as a monk. That right? People would go to him, talk to him about their problems. And he told Ajahn Brahm, if I recall correctly, that you must be like a dustbin with its base that is open. Things go in and then it immediately comes out. So that is, of course, the ideal state. But um, with with me going through this journey, uh, what I come to realize is that the choices are eventually made by them. It is not my choice. I'm here holding space. Anything good happens, it is to their credit, to their own insights. Anything undesirable happens, it is through their choice. So that that in a way allows me to be at ease with whatever decision that was made. I literally just got goosebumps. That's so powerful. <laughs> Thanks for sharing. And I think we can wrap up the episode with maybe a final sharing from our podcast guest today. Is there any advice or one thing that you would like our listeners to take away from this episode? Since um, we are talking about mental health or rather mental distress, managing through them, 
it can be us managing them ourselves or us being there for others, I would have to offer two sets of advice, right? And we go back to what we've spoken about earlier. Um, cultivation of mindfulness allows us to see our own thoughts as they arise and then trying to create that space to respond rather than react. This would allow us to then seek help in a more objective manner. And in helping others, definitely in generating the compassion and also the wisdom to look look up for signs and the courage to step up and ask how are you, that would definitely help those around us to allow them to have that space to talk to you. Thank you so much. And with that, I hope this episode has been very inspiring and enlightening. And perhaps take action, reach out to someone, a close friend, a friend who's distant, and really, truly ask them, how are you? Provide a space for them to just share and let you know how they are doing. And if this episode has been beneficial to you, feel free to also share this. You never know who might need to listen to this today. With that, thank you for for tuning in all the way to the end and stay happy and wise.